feel like I'm on the news. Good morning. It is AM 1160 WCCS 101.1 FM in addition. We are joined by Facebook Live on our Facebook Live page. And the U92 Sports Channel, you may listen to today's candidates debate by going to U92radio.com and clicking on the Sports Channel player. It is the debate for the Indiana Area School Board. The spring primary election comes up on Tuesday, and there are seven candidates for the Indiana Area School Board. And they are vying for four positions on the November ballots, and all are cross filed I'll introduce the candidates in the order by which their names were drawn moments ago, and this will be the order of their responses to our questions today, some of which have been submitted by our listeners here to 1160 WCCS. Our candidates today, Barbara Barker, John Mussolini, Jeffrey Giese, Lulu Lowry, Tom Harley, I'm going to put that back up there so I can read it. Okay. There you go. Julia Tremarchi Cucaro and Kenneth Hall. We're not going to accuse Tom of stealing Julia's <laughs> main <laughs> guy. All right. Well, let's get underway this morning. And uh, just a brief note to explain how the rules will work for this uh, candidates' debate. Uh, there will be 90-second uh, opening statements and closing statements afforded to each of our candidates this morning, and again, in the order by which their names were drawn for the initial uh, part, uh, for the opening, and then we'll redraw names for the uh, closing statements. 90 seconds for those opening statements. Each of them will then be given a question. We'll move in the order by which they were drawn for the first person to respond to each question. And then all of the other candidates will give be given 60 seconds uh, to respond or rebut uh, to the remarks of the first question. Okay. It sounds confusing. It isn't really. And the timer behind this will help the candidates to uh, know exactly when their time is up. 90 seconds uh, for each of these opening statements. And uh, let's get underway. Barbara Barker, you are first this morning. Hi, my name is Barb Barker. Oh. Hi, my name is Barb Barker. I am a borough resident, and I currently have two kids at East Pike Elementary School. And you may remember me, I did the petition um, against the uh, proposed building project and school closure. I knocked on, I knocked on your door or seen you at a parade and talked to you. And uh, I decided to run for school board because I saw the academic integrity of the district going downhill with this current board. And I really want the community to have a voice and reflect that through my vote on the board. John Mussolini is next. You have 90 seconds. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is John Mussolini. I've been a resident of Indiana for 30 years. Uh, I did my undergraduate and graduate work at IUP. I uh, was a math teacher in this district for 25 years, five years as an administrator, and the last four years I've served on the board. Uh, and the word serve is important because my decision to run for the board was about service and providing this community with my expertise. Uh, I have, in, during my time in this district, been on the forefront of innovation, and especially in technology. While an administrator, I led the Classrooms of the Future program. I was instrumental in developing Ideal, Indiana's online uh, education program, and have been serving with our teachers in the development of uh, new curriculum and new ways of instruction. And I hope to be able to continue my interest and my uh, you know, contribution of service to this district on the school board for the next four years. Thank you. Our next candidate this morning is Jeffrey Giese. Good morning, everyone. This is an important election cycle. I believe I have the experience, education, and qualifications to serve the district in a very broad capacity. My experiences are very diversified. As a teacher for 29 years, an administrator for eight years, that provided me the opportunity to have exposure to career and technical education, special and gifted educational services, budget and finance experiences, hiring practices, student and personnel discipline, labor relations including negotiations, professional development for our staff, as well as policy writing. I think those are all very important attributes for the voters to consider as they cast their vote on May 16th. For those reasons, I am running for the one of four seats available on the board. 
Running a district from a broad-based perspective is critical. It's an obligation that the board has, and I feel my skill sets meet that obligation cleanly and succinctly. Thank you very much. Uh, next for us this morning on our candidates debate, Uda Lowry. Good morning. Um, I've been an Indiana school district resident for nearly a decade, and my husband John and I have decided to raise our daughter here. She currently attends junior high and previously attended East Pike and Horace Mann. My commitment to education is what motivates me to seek election as a member of the Indiana Area School District School Board. Listening to the constituents and using this information to make informed decisions is critical for us to continue to move our schools forward and allow our students to reach their maximum potential. In addition to that, we need to be able to provide resources to our teachers so that they can provide the best education to help all of the students be successful. Burdening the district with increased debt accrued through unnecessary construction projects will limit the district's ability to provide these resources both to the teachers and to the students. Smart use of public funds to enhance educational programs is key, and the voters have um, indicated that their concern is um, related to limited funds um, as a result of property taxes and the current reassessment. Our current schools are high performing, our physical structures are solid, and our educators are really talented. Issues with our current facilities can be remedied with reasonable costs, and we can extend the lifespan of those buildings. Wise use of public funds to improve education is what's going to positively impact education and our students' experiences in the district. Our strong performing schools coupled with other local initiatives and partnering with local state governing entities is what makes the district a vibrant and sought after place to live. Time is up. Thank you very much. Our next candidate this morning is Tom Harvin. Good, uh, good morning. I've been a resident for uh, over 30 years in Indiana. Um, the raised three children in the district. Uh, I've served on the board for four and a half years. We've had two years of this current board dominated by professional educators and their spouses. What have they done? They've raised taxes to the maximum allowed by law each and every year they've been in office. They're running a budget deficit currently of $1.5 million. They have gutted the teaming at the junior high. They've eliminated funding for all field trips. They've reduced the drama program. They've reduced the reading and math specialists at the elementary level. They recently approved a five-year teacher's contract granting raises of almost 2% annually, raised the extra duty, extra pay for 1% for the next five years. The mega school project and the pay raises will add over $1.5 million to the expenditures. The budget that they currently are running is $1.5 million out of whack. The reserve account will be reduced and destroyed within a few short years, and the cutting will have to be done with a sledgehammer. The mega school project is ill-conceived and poorly executed. The site plan will result in horrendous traffic jams, creating dangerous, dangerous conditions for our children that cannot be solved by science and security. The building is designed for current population and no growth. On the west side of town, the result will be, uh, of adding, will be adding trailers in that advanced parking lot. I ask you to please stop this insanity. The election next Tuesday will be a referendum on the actions of the, all the actions of this board. Vote to replace the professional educators. Vote for Ford Election Day. And Julie Tamarki, Kirk Road, Beauty Lowry, Your channel. Time is up. Thank you. Julia Tremarki Kukuro, you are next. Thank you, Todd. It's a pleasure to be here on this rainy morning. Um, I'm happy, though, because the Penguins, Penguins won last night. It was a great game. They look like the Pittsburgh Penguins. Um, I am um, running for school board for re-election to the board, primarily because I don't think there's anything more important in terms of public service than um, raising our children to be productive citizens in the world in which they're going to live. I'm very proud of our district, particularly our uh, progress in early childhood education and our STEM programs, technology programs, science, technology, engineering, and math. I have sat on this board now for almost four years, and I am opposed <coughs> to the new building project. I'm not opposed to progress, and I do believe there's a lot of work to be done, but I am opposed to this project at its, as it is presently configured. It's too expensive and it's too disorganized for me to support. Going forward, I think this election is crucial for the voters to get out and say what they want. It's important that people vote. I would hope that people think about fiscal security every bit as much as they think about education. I currently chair the Finance Committee. I'm uh, familiar with the numbers, 
and I'm concerned about our reserves going forward with this project. I'm concerned, period, about school funding. And until there's an uptick in our local economy, I think we have to be very concerned about fiscal responsibility. I'm a native of Indiana County. My background is in law and finance. I enjoy being on the school board. It's a wonderful opportunity to serve. Thank you. And our final candidate this morning, Kenneth Ohm. Uh, good morning. Thank you. I'd like to uh, first acknowledge uh, two longtime listeners to this radio station. My uh, mother-in-law, Verna, she's a resident of Coral. And my favorite aunt, Donna, and she's a resident of Salzburg. Longtime listeners of your radio station. And thank you for hosting this debate. Now, I'm going to speak from the heart. We have a group of educators, a special elite group of educators that is driving this school district into state res receivership. Not next year, but I guarantee you by 2021, the school district will be $80 million, at least $80 million in debt, and we'll be in state receivership. Now, what does that mean? That means cut back on academics. That's my seconds. favorite subject. Cut back on uh, extracurricular activities. Also, um, this, also, um, well, I see my time is just about up, so I'll pass the mic. No, Thank you actually have the other uh, 30 seconds coming, does he not? No. No? Okay, that's, that's good idea. Uh, All right, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those are our opening statements by our candidates. Spaghetti vendors in downtown Indiana proud to serve the public interests of Indiana County by serving as the presenting sponsor of this morning's Indiana School Board debate. Spaghetti vendors, absolutely Italian. Now, obviously, uh, most of these candidates uh, have a very uh, keen interest in the elementary school project. Many of our questions do address the elementary school project and so even though each of the initial questioners or answers will get 90 seconds uh, with the initial question and the rebuttal is only 60, there will be plenty of opportunity for you to uh, make your opinions known because many of these questions approach the elementary school project just from different angles. And so Barbara Barker, you will get the first chance at this one and you will have 90 seconds. The elementary school project and the reactions to it have been well documented. The two school projects now being considered, the current alignment or some other solution. What is your position? I am 100% against it. Uh, in September when, you know, I, I knew something was up in May, the first Act 34 hearing, and I went to that, and uh, my husband spoke out, and the community didn't realize what was going on. And in September when we got the notice, hey, they're going to vote to build a uh, two-school system. I went to that meeting, and from there on, I started going to all the meetings, all the committee meetings, all of the school board meetings, speaking out, uh, trying to make the public aware because the school district was not doing their due diligence in informing the community what was going on. And I knew a 900-student school would be bad for the academics of my children. My children, my youngest is in pre-K. She'll be in kindergarten next year. She will be in this proposed new building if it is built. And I knew that would harm my children. So that's why I'm so outspoken. I am against this. It financially does not make any sense. All right. Thank you very much. Um, in order now, uh, John Mussolini, you'll have the next uh, opportunity for this question. You need me to rephrase it to you, or would you like to just go ahead? I don't need the microphone. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to, to address. Uh, what led me to take the action of supporting this new school uh, configuration. We've been studying this for over a year. This is certainly something that six years ago has come up for discussion. The reason that we're looking at the configuration of the arts is because it's the most cost-effective way to modernize our four elementary, to modernize our elementary buildings. We no longer need four elementary buildings. The college, kind of education we're wishing to provide our, our children today it was not, is not conducive to buildings that were built 100 years ago or 60 years ago. Renovations haven't happened in these buildings in any time recently. Uh, the most current renovated building is East Pike, and that was in 1999. The educational benefits in, would include a concentration of resources. Right now, we have difficulty in having all of our faculty meet the needs of our students because they're traveling between buildings. In a two-building complex, 
we would certainly be able to do that. And we can demonstrate that it is cost effective to do. Uh, do I have the 90 minutes, or? And you should have the 60. This should be 60. Yep, okay. Uh, then I'll, I'll stop and sorry to everybody else. We, we discovered at the last moment that our timer does not have a 90 second option. That's why we had to, had to change it that way. So this is 60 seconds. Uh, uh, responses or rebuttals are not mandatory. If, if there's anybody that does not wish to respond, just pass the microphone on to the next one. Uh, Jeff Casey, you are next. I think something needs done, but according to the school code, this sitting board has the duty and responsibility to make those decisions. And it's been well chronicled here lately in the news that this move or push to stop the school project is held up by law from the Montourville School District lawsuit. And I think it's really important for the listeners to know that fact checking is important. I think there's a certain obligation that we have to be truthful with the constituents and not provide alternative facts. The Rand Corporation just recently conducted a survey and Mr. Lewis, the COO, reported that there is a truth decay. And I think some of what we're seeing today as a part of this process, there's been a significant amount of truth decay and we need to keep the facts front and center. All right, thank you very much. Um, Udi Lowry, would you care to respond as well? Absolutely. Um, I think the proposed building project is arguably the most important issue for the voters um, this election cycle. And the planned $32 million building project is going to dramatically and negatively affect what we're able to do in the district to provide education. Um, I disagree that it doesn't seem to me that we need $32 million to solve um, or modernize our current elementary schools. And I think the facts are kind of muddy. Um, the public has not been able to see the final site plan, and that is really concerning. There was a lot of um, effort taken to have parents come to talk to the, uh, meet with the architects when this project was first proposed. But since then, there's been no demonstrated opportunity for us to see what it is that this $32 million is going to go to. So um, I'm really concerned that it's not well planned. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Harmon, do you care to respond? Yeah, I do, I do care to respond as well. There's a lot to respond to. Uh, firstly, I am against the program, <coughs> the, uh, the uh, mega school, the, the, the Indiana Area School District uh, Committee recommended a three school system. When this board took when this board came in, it suddenly became a two school system. I also believe that with the options that parents have today with cyber school and alternate schooling, that the that the proposed savings will disappear. Furthermore, the information that was in the paper uh, presented by the board president and now by Mr. Giese, that I haven't done my research is erroneous. He's quoting a county court decision that has no jurisdiction on Indiana County. We're quoting a, state, a Supreme Court decision which has not been overturned and has in fact been supported. So those facts can be litigated. And if we have to do that, that's what we'll do. Right. Mr. Moreno, I, I would no. like to... Uh, uh, no, no, it's not your time. Oh. Okay. Julia My Tremarki Kukuro, it's your turn. Yeah, this is Julia Tremarki Kukuro. Um, I want to say one thing about these numbers. Um, it's not alternative reality. Um, it's reality. Our, if we go through with the full funding of this in, uh, new project, uh, without likely cost overruns, uh, we would be at a total bond debt of about $75 million. That's just bond debt. The total liabilities of the district are going to run us up to about $130 million, maybe $140 million. And that includes our about $80 million on the PEASERS, the ICTC debt, and the bond debt. So we're talking huge liabilities. We're doubling, almost doubling the debt of this district now. I don't think the new school is cost effective. I think it's been haphazard and poorly planned. If we have it, we, we still have no answers. We've already borrowed $10 million. So this, is, this vote in this election is not about stopping the project, in my opinion, because we've already borrowed almost $10 million. Where we are on this is that we still owe the architect and the uh, Massaro a million bucks. Okay, your time is up. Kenneth Alts, um, 
your response to our first question? Well, my response is I'm, I'm against this, pro uh, this project. Uh, I can go on and quote what uh, Julia just said, or Tom said, but uh, I want to go back to what Jeff said about the Rand Corporation studies. And believe me, you know, I've served 28 years in the military, and I'm very familiar with the Rand Corporation. And they slant their reports to who's buying it. The Rand Corporation told us the first Gulf War, it's negative. Well, we proved that. It wasn't. Now, let's look at some facts. A third of the district is on fixed income. And wherever you research, the numbers are different. 41 to 44 percent of the student population with Indiana School District qualifies for federal uh, reimbursement on school lunches. Your time is up. Thank you. And now, according to the rules, if there is one candidate who rebuts, the initial uh, respondent gets uh, 60 seconds uh, for a final say on this particular Mr. question. And so, Ms. Barker, it is back to you. Hi, yes, it's Bergen. Uh, you know, I question is modern facilities that we need to update to modern faci facilities. If you've been to the board meetings uh, and you've seen the recent diagrams of the proposed building project, they're building the same building that is at Ben Franklin. Concrete walls, ceramic towel, small windows. There's, there's nothing really modern about it. It's not a building for the future education of our children. Renovation would, you know, if something's wrong, if there's an issue with plumbing, you fix it. My roof leaks on my house, so I'm going to get a new roof. In fact, Ben Franklin has a brand new roof on it. Why would you tear down the existing building when it has a brand new roof for a new building? It's just absurd. Thank you. Okay, very good. Those are our questions. Uh, that's the first question. The second question, the first respondent uh, with 90 seconds to respond is John Mussolini. Uh, and then uh, any others who care to rebut may do so. And again, in the order in which your names were drawn previously. Mr. Mussolini, you get the first chance at this question. It's a listener question. And uh, this is how it is written. If you are for the new school, please explain the future benefits for students. If you're against it, please explain what it take, would take for you to support the building of the new school. Sure. Uh, when you look at the proposed new school and the renovations of Ben Franklin, what you see is classrooms that are designed for the 21st century and not for the, the 19th century. We're looking at classrooms, we're looking at, especially at Ben Franklin, where the class sizes are substantially lower than they are in the other buildings in the district. East Pike has the most modern facilities. It's the most has the largest classroom space. It allows teachers to implement the new classroom instruction that we're talking about, having mobility, moving students in groups. That becomes extremely difficult at Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin also is not uh, does not allow students to uh, <coughs> excuse me under the new configuration. It does allow our administrators to better schedule faculty resources. Right now, we have teachers who are traveling between all four buildings to deliver special education, music, arts to our students. In the two-building configuration, those traveling teachers are greatly reduced, increasing the services to the students and the facility. The new buildings will also have modern technology. We'll have classrooms dedicated to STEM, to arts. We're going to have the opportunity for larger classroom spaces so that the, the training that we're giving our teachers on mass customized learning, our new English program, will allow them to have the space to do that. Um, shoot, lost the idea. Um, well, I'll let it go. I okay, have to very good. Uh, that's Mr. Yusselini. I'm assuming, um, is anybody going to opt out of this question? Is everybody good on this question? Mr. Deasy, you're next. I think really the, the question is, education has gone through several metamorphosis over the decades. And learning occurs differently today. Students don't sit in linear rows and have teachers lecture to them about core subject matters. They are integrated in learning communities within that classroom. You need to provide space adequate for makerspace, for team collaboration, and other educational objectives that can be accomplished through today's learning and today's student learning style. 
Students do not learn the same way that they did previously. They are in a different age where technology is critical and important. Some of our neighboring districts are outclassing our community because of the lack of Wi-Fi accessibility, and especially in Horace Mann. That's a critical problem. Those students aren't being afforded the education that they not only need, but deserve. Very good. Uh, Uta Lowry, the next question that is for you, or, or your rebuttal, please. Um, I am not for this project at this time, at this location, with this poorly thought out plan. Um, I do not believe that we need to spend $32 million to create educational environments that our students are going to be successful in and to provide them with the technology that they need. I've been to the buildings and grounds meeting. There have been no discussions on alternatives on how we can take what we our existing buildings and make them work for what our students and our teachers say that they need. The only conversation has been pushing through this new $32 million building on land that is arguably too small and will cause way more congestion in that area of town than we have ever anticipated. And I think the residents are going to have some really major concerns along, as well as the businesses that are um, along Grand Franklin Road. So at this time, I can't be convinced to support that project. Okay, let me restate the question just so our listeners know of what we're talking. If you are for the new school, please explain the future benefits for students. If you're against it, please explain what it would take for you to support the building of the new school. Mr. Hardy, you're next. Well, I'm clearly against the, the mega school. The, uh, the classrooms are maybe 50 square feet larger than the current Ben Franklin classrooms. But we really don't know that because the board has allowed the solicitor to respond for a request for the right to know not to give us building plans. So those building plans haven't been seen by the public since November. So we don't know what they're building. On top of that, I suspect the board members haven't seen these, the final plans, and certainly not the site plan. So we're being, we're buying a pig and a poke. On top of that, the technology that's currently in our classrooms will be the technology that will be in the new building. All the classrooms and elementary schools have the technology that they will be using. There is no new technology. The rooms that they're proposing are four walls and a door, and that's the basic building plan. Um, Julia yeah, this first. is Julia. Um, we have to compete. Um, our children have to be able to compete in the future with people from all over the United States for jobs and, and career uh, goals. But you have to compete within the constraints of your revenues, less your expenses. And right now we're, over, we're, we're, we're turned around the wrong way. We have more expenses in the current budget, in the upcoming budget than we do revenues. Tough to increase our revenues right now because we're experiencing a little bit of a downturn in our economy. So we have to be realistic and try to do the best we can. I'm trying to be practical. We borrowed about 10 million. What can we do with it? I support the Director Schroeder's plan. Plus, I also support a little bit more money to build more classrooms and multi-purpose rooms. Uh, I think the public has to get engaged and vote and come to meetings and let us know what they really need as opposed to what everybody wants. Thank you. And finally this morning, Kenneth Alton. Well, I'm against this plan, and if we have a technology issue over at uh, Horse Man, I think we're uh, talking to the wrong IT people. Uh, that's my first thought. Oh, and um, let me uh, continue. Technology to me is constantly revolving or in evolving. The, uh, it turns over every two to five years, two to three years faster. Now, I think we can, uh, we can improve some of our computer ability, establish a mainframe, things like that, and that can be done in-house and resourced. In fact, on the uh, school website, you know, you have various portals for uh, employees, students, and I think that's working very well, uh, at least on the public side. Now, I'm going to see, oh, I'm out of time, and I'm going to pass the, okay, the mic to Barbara. Uh, Barbara Barker, uh, you do get the chance. This almost forgot you. I, I'm sorry for that, but uh, Barbara it's Barker. It's okay. Thank you very much. 
uh, I would never support a 900 student school because all the studies say elementary schools should be around 400 uh, students, that it's detrimental to academics to have a large elementary school. Uh, if, if Ben Franklin, if the current board is so um, upset about new Ben Franklin, how about closing Ben Franklin, selling the land as it's the most valuable uh, land for the school buildings, and uh, putting money into Eisenhower, Horseman, and East Pike. Very good. And uh, finally, John Ussolini, uh, you had the question initially. You get to close out this okay, case. Thank you. I do want to respond to a couple of comments that were made. Uh, our attorneys have advised us not to release the, the detailed plans because of security issues, but the floor plans have been made available and, and can be viewed. This project has not been rushed. We've been spending over a year in talking about developing and coming up with the best plan possible. This idea of a mega school, and I, I read the research that was read at, at the board meeting from PSBA by class size. But if you look at it carefully and, and go to the end of the report, it says it's very difficult for districts to build small schools. And if districts are going to build a larger school, then the plan that we have, the school within a school concept, that has two essentially 450 student schools attached by a common area, is exactly the way to go to meet those benefits of having small schools. So it's not that we're ignoring that research. The other research that has been ignored, though, is adding another layer of separation and between, build, uh, between grade levels. So the grade reconfiguration that research on transitions was ignored, and this will restore what the, what the citizens want, which is a K to, K to 5 school. Okay, time is up. Thank you very much. Uh, spaghetti vendors in downtown Indiana proud to serve the public interests of Indiana County by serving as the presenting sponsor of this morning's Indiana Area School Board debate. Spaghetti vendors, absolutely Italian. A reminder to our candidates this is on Facebook Live, and we have hundreds of viewers, uh, and uh, so you need to remember that you're on camera at all times. and. Uh, uh, just take that into consideration as we continue our proceedings here this morning. The next question is uh, Jeffrey Giese. So you get the first chance at this question. And um, this is, again, another listener question this morning. Should the results of the primary election be given consideration in the elementary school discussion? Absolutely not. This board has been duly elected and by the school code is fulfilling its responsibility. School code, not opinion, fact. School code dictates that this board has the responsibility to act. One of those responsibilities is inclusive of building projects. So once that has been decided, wherever it goes, this sitting board has fulfilled its state required responsibility and it should not enter into the discussion beyond the point in which they decide. Period. Okay. Any of you going to opt out of this question? Not Uda, a chance. Uda Lowry, <laughs> it is your chance. Um, Mr. Giese's point about the school board's responsibility um, brings up other responsibilities that school boards have to their constituents, one of which is to listen. The other is to make fiscally responsible decisions that are going to improve education. And Based on all the meetings I've been to, and it's been countless meetings, I have not heard an argument as to how specifically $32 million building project that will probably end up costing more is going to enhance the educational experience of our students. I've asked teachers, they've told me we're going to do the same thing that we're doing in our current building in this new building. Nothing about how I teach or my classroom is going to be different. All right, uh, Tom Harvey, uh, that microphone will stay on this oh, side of the Sorry. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tom Harvey. All okay. right. Uh, again, the question, just to restate the question for folks, uh, should the results of the primary election be given consideration in the elementary school discussion? I wish they would be. I wish the board would pay attention. This, this, is, a, this is a lame duck board even before the primary. There's only there's, there's, here's the candidates. There's four seats up. The board is going to change the nature um, and probably, most likely, become a, a, a majority against the project. The community has signed 2,000 and some names to a petition. The board has ignored it. We have tried to get a referendum, and so many won't allow it. So here we are. The board president has made this a referendum on the project. 
the board will most likely ignore that referendum and, and proceed as they have. And they've been basically ignoring the public comments, the pleading that has gone on in that board meeting. Um, and, and so I fully expect them to ignore it. I wish they wouldn't. Okay, Julia Tremarki, who corrupt? Oh, thank you, Todd. Um, no, I don't agree. I think the board has a responsibility to pay attention to what the voters think and say. This is a crucial election, and the board has a responsibility not to be haphazard. In my, the way I grew up, you know, to, in one year, to figure out how to spend $32 million plus, that's a lot of money out of this county. Our total budget is only about $55 million in terms of revenues from the state, federal, and local levels. So that's a big chunk of money that we're talking about plus interest so that is haphazard and the first responsibility that the board always has is an ethical responsibility to be good stewards of the taxpayers money and, and create good educational programs so yes i think the board's going to have to pay attention to this election how can they not kenneth Holmes. well let me uh restate my position no i'm against this new project also you look at the demographics of the uh, district. The demographics, we've got a third of the district on fixed income. We have 41 to 44 percent of our student population that qualifies for lunch programs, re uh, federal reimbursement. And you look at the debt load, that's not only going to cause the, uh, the residents, uh, taxes will go up for at least 30 years. And as far as academics, I agree with what you said. She, uh, she you know, teachers will teach. Um, I'm um, at a real loss because this has frustrated when a board that's duly elected to represent the student, uh, to the, uh, the residents of the school district. They're duly elected and they refuse to listen and my time is up, and I will listen. Barbara Barker. Uh, yes, um, my comment to the school board is, you know, this election is going to speak vo uh, volumes. Uh, people are going to go out and they're going to vote. Please vote this Tuesday. And their uh, voting, how they vote, is going to, to speak. And I have to say, you're not God. Like, you, you have to listen to the constituents that elect you. Okay, and uh, John Mussolini, your comments. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I intend to continue the building project, at least through the project going out to bids. Will it be too expensive? Well, that's why we hired Macero Corporation to protect the district's interest to make sure that this $32 million total project doesn't exceed that. If it would, I would certainly reconsider what we would be doing with the, with the project. As far as debt goes, let's need to understand that this project will add 1% to our budget for debt. Total, right now, we spend 6% for all of our debt load. That is not unreasonable for a district our size, and is not an overburden on the public. Uh, listening to constituencies, there is a constituency out there that this board, or people haven't listened to, and that's our custodians and maintenance people, the folks who work in our buildings. And I took the time, as building as a ground chairman, to meet with them often. And what they, will, what they tell you to a person is that they're in favor of doing this because they understand what the conditions of these buildings are and that this is a, the best long-term prospect for the district. Jeffrey Giese, you had the original question. We'll give it to you once more. In your opinion, how should Indiana area approach, or rather, uh, should the results of the primary election be given consideration in the elementary school discussion? And despite the comments, my answer is still yes. And it really speaks to many issues, I believe, that's facing the district. And 1%, as John stated, would be attributed to this project. And if we break it down by the taxpayer, that comes to a very small amount. Even the 3%, based on the average income for the taxpayers in the district, that totals $81 a year. Ms. Barker, previously on another show, had indicated that makes people choose between coats and shoes and boots. Well, let me tell you, if you're waiting for the last minute to collect your tax money, it's going to be a problem for you. Most of us go about saving, putting money aside, month to month, and making sure we have money available. And we can't hold the district hostage and the students we're ch charged with educating based on all these ancillary facts. They need to be considered. They shouldn't be cast aside.
but that should not be the only criteria. Okay, thank you very much to all of our candidates as we've been addressing the elementary school project. We're going to move in another direction now. However, uh, you will be given the option uh, later in the program uh, to revisit this topic or any other topic that you wish to with a general question about uh, our discussions here this morning. Luda Lowry, you get the next question. And again, our debate this morning brought to you by Spaghetti Vendors in downtown Indiana. Proud to serve the public interests of Indiana County by serving as the presenting sponsor this morning of the Indiana Area School Board Debate, Spaghetti Vendors, absolutely Italian. The question, Mrs. Lowry, is um, the school district this week finalized a five-year contract with the teachers' union. Is it a good deal? Is it a good deal? Um, I guess it depends on who you are. If you're a school district that has unlimited resources and feels that you can still meet all the needs of the students um, and fulfill the obligations of that five-year contract, yeah, it's probably a good deal. Um, I think it puts the school board and the school district in a horrible financial situation that is going to take immense amount of work and years to recover from. If the current um, budget already is at almost $56 million, revenue is at $54 million, you have to go to your reserves. That is not an unlimited pot of money. Um, so I think, again, we, we look at what are we able to do, what can we afford? Of course I want the teachers to have a contract. Um, but I do believe that five years is way too long and I would hope that, you know, in the future that those contracts um, exist, but maybe are limited to three years or at least revisited every three years. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, anybody going to opt out of this question? Is everybody in? Mr. Hart. The five-year term of the contract puts it into three separate boards, will not get a voice, and will have no chance of making any changes to this contract. So if a health care issue comes up, like Obamacare goes away and Trump Care comes in, these things will now have to be done outside the contract. Um, it ties the hands of future boards. Um, it takes our average teacher salary from about 87000 to about $96,000. Um, we are near the top of the, um, of, the, of, the, of the region and the state in teacher salary. To pay for this, the board will have to cut positions. And class sizes will have to grow. And one of the reasons that teachers are traveling between buildings is because we've already cut positions. Um, we, need, we need reading specialists and math specialists in the elementary. So they don't need to be traveling between buildings. Um, the $32 million to, per, to, to, to rectify that situation seems like a really silly number. Julia Tremarki Kukuru. Um, I did vote against the contract, Todd. Um, the 2%, most people aren't even making yet post-recession 2% on return on their investments. We're sending the taxpayers a 3%. Uh, tax hike. Um, you know, we can talk about 17 cents a day, but you know, keep in mind that almost 15 cents of that goes to interest and, and bond attorney fees. So we're, we're front loaded on interest. Um, uh, our reserves are, if we took that 3% tax hike out every year, our reserves would be, we're, we're in the wrong direction, we're underwater. So uh, naturally, uh, I think our faculty is very important. I, I would have uh, been able to support the contract if it had been a three-year or even perhaps a four-year term. But I think during a, a, a time of fiscal uncertainty, and we don't know about the state funding, so it impacts our revenues, we have to be very careful, and we should look at these numbers more frequently, and this contract more frequently, frequently than five years. So that three years would have been, to me, um, what I would have been able to support. Thank you very much. Can I follow up? The question has to do with the new five-year teacher's contract uh, for Indiana Area School District. Thank you. I was surprised that uh, the contract length was five years. And uh, Tom just mentioned uh, the average salary. And after five years, it would be up to $96,000. I never made that amount of money as a full colonel in the United States Army. Never. Never. I think... Uh, what we have to do, and, and also some other good points from Julia and Yuda, you know, teachers are traveling building to building. You know, let's take that 32 to $40 million for this new school and let's invest it into academics. You know, I witnessed a great presentation 
the other night at the board meeting by a group of uh, teachers about reading. And it was fantastic. I remember going through something like that at uh, third or fourth grade many years ago. And my time is up. Thank you very much. Um, Barbara Barker will rephrase and restate the question for you this morning. And uh, the question has to do with the new contract for the teachers union. The school district this week finalized a five-year contract with the teachers union. Is it a good deal? My perspective on that, looking at it from a different angle, is the amount of money the raises, um, the 2% equivalence to, is at least four teachers. So we're, the junior high is hurting. The teaming has been lost. Uh, the parents are screaming, we need more special education teachers. And that's, that's not a, ma a matter of um, you know, having the teachers on one building. It's a fact, we have a, it's a student ratio per teacher ratio and there are too many students that need extra help. And so by having four more teachers, we could really help the academics. But instead, now we're locked into a five-year contract. And John Yusselin. Right, just to put things into perspective, when Mr. Harley was board president, we set settled a teacher's contract where the average salary was 2.9%. A 1.9% uh, salary contract is a lot better deal, and it's, lot, it's, and it's getting us closer to slowing down the rise of teacher salaries. The cost for that was probably going from three years to five years. If you would have done a three-year contract, it certainly would have been higher. And if you're talking about long-term budgetary planning, knowing what your teacher contributions or teacher salaries are going to be over five years certainly makes a difference. Also, as it terms of the, the fund balance part of it, we have a $6 million, almost $7 million fund balance now. Over the next five years, we, we are certainly going to have to draw on that to balance the, the, the school budget. But at the end of that, from the latest projections I looked at, we're still going to end up with about a $1.7 million balance. balance. So it, we can't finance both the building and the teacher's contract. And although there's still going to be challenges, we can still, we're still going to be able to do it. Mr. Giese, the question having to do with the teacher's five-year contract. Labor relations and negotiations is one of the things that I've been involved in a lot throughout my career. And I can tell you stability from a long-term aspect of having a contract in place ensures the lack of work stoppage. I don't believe either side won in this contract negotiation process. I think both sides had to concede. I think both sides had to give to get. And that's a hallmark of good negotiations process. I've been a negotiation team leader, I have been on negotiation teams, and I'm currently writing language in a negotiation process that I'm involved in in another county. I can honestly tell you it settles the anxiousness of the teaching staff knowing they have long-term stability as far as their contract is concerned. They don't want to have to do anything more than teach, and it becomes a distraction whenever we enter into uh, short-term negotiation processes. Okay, this question was originally phrased to Uda Lowry, and you will have the last chance to respond to what we've heard here this morning. I don't think any of us are saying that the teachers don't deserve a contract. And we do, at least I recognize that there is an advantage to knowing what your expenditures are going to be. My concern, though, is that the current tax base and the economy is not going to be able to keep up with the cost of that contract for the next five years. So um, yes, there's always a give and take. I don't think anybody um, walked away from that negotiating table and felt like they won or you know they lost, but um, because that's typically the nature of good negotiation. Um, it's a give and take. and. Um, my concern is that um, the current contract does provide yet another budgetary challenge to a budget that's already strapped. Okay, you're listening here on AM 1160 WCCS and 101.1 FM to our Indiana, Indiana Area School District debate. On Tuesday's primary election ballot, there are four positions available. There are seven candidates. They have all joined us here this morning. This program also available on Facebook Live and uh, also you can, it's being streamed at 1160wccs.com, and we have hundreds of folks watching uh, this debate this morning 
as well. And we move on to our next question, and Tom Harley, you will get the first chance at this question, and it has to do not just with the elementary schools, but with all of our Indiana Area School District buildings. In your opinion, how should Indiana Area approach future technology needs, and are the school buildings equipped now for technology expansion? The board voted to expand their bandwidth across the district um, to meet the needs, meet current and future needs. I believe that was done a few months ago. Um, we've, uh, the previous board uh, put computers into the hands of each, each um, high school student, most of the, high, most of the junior highs, and put, um, uh, made technology available in, even into the elementary school if, the pro if that program is still in place. Um, the, the future technology is unpredictable, um, but right now the basis of, of the technology is a, is, a, is a personal device, and those are in the hands of the students. Um, when, talking, when talking with principals of the buildings, I have asked what it is that, that they haven't been provided with, and I, have, I, have, I do not have a list of anything that they need to teach the students today, today, what they need. They have it. Um, anybody opting out of this question, or is everybody in? Everybody's in. Julia from Marky Cooper. Um, I don't think we're awful, and I don't think we're excellent. I think we're in the middle of the pack in terms of peers, uh, peer peer groups. When you go around, look at other schools. Um, uh, the the point I think is that we are going to need more uh, multi-use uh, space and and a new configuration. I keep saying we've got nine million bucks on the table right now that we've borrowed. Now, what's it going to take to get what we need? To, to get us through, uh, I would say, the next five years, and that we can look at seriously and not haphazardly during that time what we think we need going forward. The sticks and bricks in terms of cyber schools and everything else is not exactly always the answer to technology problems. All kinds of students now for dual education and learning online. So it's, it, we have to, this is, a, this is a part of a much longer conversation that we would have to have. I think it's almost the subject of a separate show, Todd, so maybe we can do that sometime. Annabella, it is your chance. Thank you, Julie. Th thank you. Okay, uh, to me that's a loaded question. Let's identify uh, technology. And Tom talked about servers, computers, uh, fiber wire, optics. But let's get down in a classroom. Are we teaching robotics? Are we teaching computer systems? Are we teaching uh, anything that has to do with uh, uh, server repair, programming, uh, data co coding. I don't know. I know other high schools in Western Pennsylvania have signed uh, agreements with uh, colleges. Uh, Carnegie Mellon, University of Pittsburgh, send their students down there. At the Technology Center, you know, so let's identify some of these needs. And to me, um, I, I haven't really uh, uh, been, uh, uh, I haven't really uh, investigated this to the extent because Your time as a, my time is up again. Okay. Barbara Barker. <coughs> Thank you, Ken, for that excellent response because uh, Ken's correct. What is technology? You have robotics. You, you have um, many more things than just screen time. And... Uh, you know, for that, you would need space. And building a building that is going to restrict our space is not a good thing for, for that kind of technology. As for the existing elementary schools, most of our technology is wireless. And upgrading some electrical systems would help with any, anything that needs to be plugged in. And that's not a $32 million building project. Okay. John Ussolini. Let me rephrase the question or restate the question for everybody's a benefit this morning. Um, and it has to do, hang on here a second while I get to it. In your opinion, how should Indiana area approach, uh, approach uh, future technology needs and are the school buildings equipped now for technology expansion? Let me say I'm very proud of what this district has done over the last seven, eight years in technology education. I compliment Mr. Harley, the board that he was on uh, and the board that I currently serve with for taking technology and moving forward. There was a time when Indiana 
was the last place people would go to see technology innovation. We are now the place in Pennsylvania the schools come to. We just spent, spent, we just did a major renovation at the high school to increase technology, to, to redo the technology labs, to put, uh, redo the library so it's now a, a better facility to change the upper commons into a learning center. We've invested in technology education extensively in terms of facilities at the high school and the junior high. We have not done that in elementary. With the new building and a re remodeled East Pipe, we will have the space to do the things that our teachers are talking about. We will have modern libraries. We will have media centers. We will have this, this, the facilities to have that 21st, 21st century education that everybody wants for our children. Okay. Jeffrey Giese. Technology is now and in the future, and the expansion of technology is significant. Cloud-based operations eliminates the notion for hard wire systems, and it also provides greater opportunity and access for students beyond the school day. And that's a critical point, to flip the classroom and provide opportunities for students to access curriculum beyond the school day is an important feature that I think every school needs to consider. It takes a lot of time to deliver curriculum today. Given the standards that exist from the uh, federal and state levels, teachers are taxed with meeting those standards and then the accountability through testing. So we need to make sure that we have all of the pieces in place that we can properly deliver the education model, which certainly today with our students, technology is front and center. Most of them own their own cell phone or their parents own it and they have it. And right there is the medium in which they can access to do projects and homework. Mrs. Lowry. The question talked about how should the school district approach technology needs, and I think um, a, another perspective is maybe we need to do an assessment and not just ask the teachers about what their technology needs are, but ask the students. For example, if you try to look at the Indiana Area School District website on your iPhone, you don't get the complete website. You have to go to the bottom and click that you want to see the whole website. Is that an easy fix? I don't know. I'm not a website professional, but I do know that it can be done. Um, I think students um, do have a lot of access to technology, and that's how they communicate. Currently, students are not allowed to have their cell phones in the classroom. I understand the reasons for that, but I also think there's some educational opportunities that technology can provide for students to um, use the devices they have or that the school provides in uh, classroom instruction. Your time is up. Thank you very much. And Mr. Harvey, you have the first chance at this question. You'll get the last one. Okay. Thank you much. Um, Dr. Usalini is right that the previous board um, made tremendous uh, progress at the high school level, uh, modernized the shops, modernized Ideal. Um, Ideal um, uh, is on a 21st century platform that uh, seems to be making tremendous inroads into, uh, into educating our students. Um, the, uh, uh, the junior high is, is, is needs, needs attention, and the elementaries need attention, but this attention can be done with makerspace with, 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 and incorporating it into the classroom as, a, as part of the uh, DNA of the classes. Um, we definitely need to, to move this technology down into the elementaries. Um, this is where this is where we need to capture the imagination of these children. Um, we need to make them, uh, 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 encourage them to become technologists. Thank you. We are listening this morning to our candidates debate. The Indiana Area School Board is uh, going to be a part of your ballots if you live in the Indiana Area District. And on Tuesday, there will be seven names with four positions open on the Indiana Area School Board. And we're talking with all seven of those candidates here this morning. Our uh, debate this morning is sponsored by Spaghetti Vendors in downtown Indiana, proud to serve the public interests of Indiana County by serving as the presenting sponsor of this morning's school board debate. Spaghetti Vendors, absolutely Italian. We'll have time for two more questions. One will be the general question, and uh, then we'll have our closing statements as well. Uh, Julia tremarchi Cucuro, you will get the, the first chance to respond to this question, and it reads this way. Pending legislation sponsored by Senator Don White would allow school districts the option of arming teachers or staff members. Do you favor it or are you opposed to it for Indiana area? Um, 
That's a great question, and it's just recently come up at our board meetings. Um, and there's been pros and cons. We've had good arguments on both sides. My feeling is that it's difficult to expect mature teachers um, to become uh, ballistics people. Um, and I, I think that this job is best left with professionals. So this is going to cost money. Uh, there's, there's firms that you can um, outsource to that come in, and we've, we've, we're in the process of looking at this and doing this, uh, to come in and provide security. So at this time, I can't imagine taking teachers off their jobs and having to learn, because it's going to take intense hours. And also, police officers or former police officers, they know what their reactions are under pressure. They've been studying that since they've been young people. So you know, this is a, this is a gray area as to how a, a, a teacher who's been trained in a completely different way would handle these situations. So I think it's a little too much of a risk in that for me at this time. Thank you. Okay. Kenneth Alms. What we're looking at is uh, something very precious. Yeah, this is our future, the students, from kindergarten all the way up to uh, 12th grade. I believe in a, if we have that type of money to spend, anywhere from forty to $100,000 to go to a contract company, I'd rather see that uh, money go to a uniform department. Just for an example, the Sheriff's Department. And remember now, an active shooter situation has to be confronted within 30 seconds to less than a minute. Now, I wrote a plan for uh, Fort Leavenworth, and uh, it was very, you know, the, uh, in the military, uh, the military police were replaced by Department of Defense uh, Security Forces. Okay, your time is up. Oh, my time is up. All right, thank you very much. Barbara Barker, the question again uh, for everybody's benefit here this morning. Pending legislation sponsored by Senator Don White would allow school districts the option of arming teachers or staff members. Do you favor it for Indiana area? Uh, my flat answer is teachers are paid to teach and they should not have guns. And so there are other options like having resource off, uh, officers who are trained. Okay. John Yusselini. Yeah, with respect to Senator White's bill, I'm sure that there are rural districts in this state where that may be a viable option for them because of their access to local and state police. As a teacher, my sensibilities don't lend itself to Army. Uh, if we're going to spend the money, I'd rather spend it to hire another counselor or to bring in a mental health specialist to work with, with troubled students. Uh, I, just, I just can't support that. Jeffrey Casey. Being an avid hunter and owner of multiple firearms, I don't support this notion at all. I, I think it's ill-advised, and I really do believe that we're putting our teachers at greater peril by having them armed. I've talked to many of my uh, friends who are former police officers, including Pennsylvania State Police, and whenever they arrive on an active shooter scene, they have to make split-second decisions, friend or foe. And because of the environment in which they're entering, they can't quickly ascertain that. And I'm afraid, in addition to collateral damage of potentially injuring or worse with students, we could start to lose faculty. The other part of that is, to be a competent marksman, which that's what you would be asking, there's an awful lot of professional development that is required to maintain that level of competence in using a firearm. Good and Lowry. Again, the question, pending legislation sponsored by Senator John White would allow school districts the option of arming teachers or staff members. Do you favor that for Indiana area? I can understand where the legislation is coming from, and um, like Dr. Ussolini said, I think for some rural districts, it is what makes sense. That is an option that they may choose to employ. Um, for Indiana, I don't think that there's a need for that. I think, like Barbara said, teachers are paid to teach. I think there's too high of a risk that um, they are either going to end up 
um, being confronted by the trained police officers who respond to a situation and end up injured themselves. Um, and I think that guns in schools just set a dangerous um, environment for our students and gives the teachers yet one more thing that they have to control. Um, and they really should be focusing on the students. And uh, finally this morning for this question, Tom Hardy. Thank you. Um, our the Indian Area School District's prime job is to educate students. We need to focus on that. We're in, we exist inside communities. Indiana Borough currently patrols the borough schools on an active basis. They know the buildings, they know the teachers, they know the staff. That is an ideal situation in an emergency situation. The, the township schools are protected by the state police who do not patrol, and they're much more vulnerable to problems. I cannot imagine a, a, a police entering the buildings and, 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 and confronting an adult with a weapon and that adult, even if it was a teacher, not being shot. In Indiana Area District, having the local communities that are responsible for security provide the security for our students and their kids, I think is, is critical that we work with the local community uh, policing agencies and make this a safe community. And the last word on this question for Julia Tremont. Kukurel, you're good? Okay, very good. We'll move on to the next question. And this one has uh, come from one of our listeners. Uh, and uh, the question is this, do you support video recording and live streaming all board meetings regardless of location and posting on YouTube so that the public can observe, hear, and see the contents of every meeting? Kenneth Hall, you are first. Thank you. Excellent, excellent question. And yes, I support that because a lot of times uh, you, you, um, you may have computer access and uh, you might be busy that night. You want to catch up on things. And uh, I, I totally support this. Uh, it uh, is part of our uh, growing technology. And I'm done. Oh, you're done. Okay. And you didn't this is the one time when you, you didn't run out of time. All right, well, we'll move the question then on to Barbara Barker. And the question has to do with uh, video recording and live streaming all board meetings regardless of location and posting on YouTube so that the public can observe, hear, and see the contents of every meeting. Absolutely. We would not have this ill-advised building project if the residents knew about it. And uh, you know, a long time ago, the agenda used to be published in the newspaper, and it is no longer published in the newspaper. And actually, since October, I have been um, live streaming on my uh, phone and uploading it to my Facebook page. And the recently, the lovely folks that are running um, a Facebook page called Indiana Area SOS uh, have been sharing my videos so that people can go on there. And the school board currently is, um, when a meeting is held in the uh, boardroom, it is being um, live streamed onto YouTube. And I applaud them for doing that. Okay. Johnny Ussolini. I certainly support live streaming our board meetings, but the, the difficulty is we don't have the equipment to do it outside of the boardroom. And it's taken us almost six months to get the boardroom so that we have a functioning system. So the district will need to explore portable equipment, but at this point we don't have it. If we had it, I have no objection to live streaming our board meetings wherever they are. Okay, Jeffrey DC. I don't believe in any good conscience you could oppose such an action. It's imperative for an informed constituency and public to be aware of what's going on. And I can honestly say that I have not had the opportunity to attend board meetings because of conflicting schedules, except on a limited basis. However, that stated, I've been able to at least go online and view the board meetings that have occurred in the boardroom. And I think that's an important fact that was brought up here. Everybody's schedule today is quite hectic and filled from morning till night. And for everybody to have the availability and ability to attend the meeting in person is oftentimes a significant challenge, especially for families that have multiple children, especially younger children. It gives them that opportunity to be able to be in the know and know what's going on at the board level. Okay. Udo Lowry. Um, 
I agree. I think video streaming board meetings is a great idea. Um, I would like to suggest that we take it one step further. Um, Barb mentioned that um, you know you can stream, record, do what we're doing here on Facebook Live. So it would not be a stretch to have someone do that and post that information either on the Indiana School District Facebook page, on the website, some way that doesn't necessarily require um, significant expenditures and additional technology, although if that's the only way to do it, then um, you know we can look at how you could get those funds to do that. Um, the other thing that would be really nice is if there was a way for people to participate from home. You know, if they can't come um, due to whatever limitations, their schedule or physical limitations or whatever, um, see if there's an opportunity to allow for some participation from people who are actually um, going to be viewing the live stream. Okay, and uh, Tom Harley, you're next. I'm, I'm in favor of live streaming. I'm in favor of live streaming the board meetings, the committee meetings, the tours of the buildings. Um, I would like to make the information available to the public. I'm in favor of making every document that is reviewed in the public sector available to the public and not restricted as it currently are by, uh, uh, by denial by the solicitor. So if you're talking about a subject, to make it available, to hand it out, to, make the, to allow the public to see what you see on the board. Um, it's the only way for the public to have a chance of being informed. When they talk about a subject that they do not share, and they pick up the papers at the end and put it in their pocket, we do not, have, we do not benefit from their knowledge. How can we make an informed decision? So I would extend that to not only live streaming everything the board does, but also to make all the documents, all the drafted documents available except for the few things that are restricted to executive session, which are a very limited number. Okay. Uh, Julia Tremarki Kukura. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I support it. No question. Um, but I want to um, tell the taxpayers that it's not free. It has a cost, and the technology in general is not inexpensive. So dollar for dollar, we have to figure out how to spend, get that budget to the point where we spend more on technology. And often it doesn't work. Okay, so we've had, we, we need to do better with it. There's no question about that. I also support on a county but wide basis um, as much broadband as we can possibly afford because there's too many people in the whole Commonwealth that don't have access to broadband. All right, and uh, the question was originally posed to Kenneth Alt, and you'll have the final word on this particular question. Uh, looking at uh, live streaming, if I recall correctly, uh, IUP has a TV station. I think they do. I think it's still in business. And uh, did somebody uh, on the board mention that? You know, they could have walked over and done a remote site with their camera equipment, posted it right to YouTube or the board's website. In fact, uh, sit around and have some commentary after the board meeting, comments. I also support what Tom and Julia said. Tom said every document, except the ones that are limited in executive sessions, everything. You know, the, uh, the PennDOT's plan, PennDOT's response, the school's response, you know, things like that. They are all paid for by you, the residents of Indiana Area School District. And um, two seconds, I'm out of time. There you go. Uh, we are listening this morning to our candidates debate for the Indiana Area School Board. We'll have our final question, which is the open question, and then we will uh, have our closing statements, and uh, since uh, the situation is the way that it is and everybody has had the 90-second opportunity with their initial response, we'll limit the, uh, the open question to 60 seconds and we'll do it alphabetically. Uh, and so the open question is um, you uh, have had many questions here this morning. Is there something that has been discussed here this morning on which you would like to follow up? And I didn't go to Indiana area, but by my reading, according to the alphabet, Kenneth Alt, you're going to be first. Thank you. I think this is a great forum. Um, some questions were great. And um, I appreciate the station for taking time out to uh, support uh, this debate. I know it does take a little bit away from the revenue, advertising dollars, things like that, but I appreciate it. 
a lot of citizens are uh, looking at the, uh, the election coming up on Tuesday, and it's like an in information gathering process before they make that decision in the voting booth. Vote. All right. Barbara Barker, you are next alphabetically. The question is, is there something that has been discussed here today that you would like to follow up upon? Yes, it's this concept of, since, sorry, Mr. Deavy, you called me out on it, $81. You know, it's $81 for a new building. That's 1%. Essentially, you have to look at this building project like a pot. You're just paying the bare minimum, the interest, for the first 10 years, and it's really going to hit us in year 10. And nobody looks at the finances past five years. Uh, I hope to live in this community for the next 20 years, and I want the taxes to be affordable. And so to say, well, $81, you can afford that, if you go and you talk to residents of the borough, they cannot. It is literally a, their winter jacket and a pair of shoes for their kids. They can't afford to feed their children. Uh, almost half of our kids are on free and reduced lunch. It tells us that, you know, we're hurting. We're really hurting. Julia Tremarki Kukuro, I'm going with the Kukuro as the <laughs> alphabetical index here, and the question is, is there something that has been discussed here uh, that you would like to follow up upon? Um, yes, thank you. Um, actually, the free and reduced lunch is about 42%. So we, that, you know, we're not the wealthiest district in the state, but we're not, the, we're not the, at the bottom either. Um, academics, we do pretty well. Um, this business of the $81 or whatever, um, keep in mind, this is front-loaded with interest. So you're paying the bondsman, the bond council makes a lot of money on this, and you're paying uh, you know, probably $75 of that as interest, particularly for the first five years, then the 10 years. We don't even begin to pay down principal. That's the way a wrap works. So there's benefits to wraps, but that's the, des that's the detriment. I very much enjoy serving on this board. It's a challenge um, right now. We are having to watch every dollar. There's nothing spare. We're very lean right now. We have a little bit of a declining tax base, and we have to adjust. We have to get our game up because, regardless of how much money we have, we still have to educate these students, and we've got to get, we've got to pick ourselves up and get ready for the future. Thank you. Okay, very good. Jeffrey Giese. And I stand by my previous comments. Yeah, there's. Whenever we try to overinflate to make a point, I think the point needs to be keep your eye on the prize. And currently the 3% that's being proposed by the 17-18 budget by the school board equates to, for the average taxpayer, $81 per year. There will be some more, some less. And to be honest with you, I really do believe there are people in our community that are strapped. But the entirety of the district should not be predicated on the education that it delivers based on that tidbit of information. And I don't want that to sound insensitive or callous, <laughs> but several people have indicated that it's unrealistic, it's unattainable. The fact that it doesn't come out is 1.7% of the, that 3% is fixed cost every year. So the taxes are gonna go up. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Harley, you are next. I'm glad Mr. Gacy told us the tax has been going up. The uh, board's uh, illustration of uh, the... Mr. Harley, just a moment. Your microphone is... It, it got to zero. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for switching the microphone. Okay. Can I get my 10 seconds back? Yes, you get your 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, boy, I forgot what I said. It was really good, too. Um, <laughs> the illustration for the budget that results in a reserve account at the end of five years shows 3% taxes every year. Not just this year, every year. Every year, forever. The previous board looked, looked down longer than five years, and we thought that we could retire the entire debt within 10 years, which would allow then the board at 2025 to have a lot of flexibility. This is critical. We are throwing away the investment that the previous board made in our four buildings, tossing it out the door with the baby, and we're going to build, so there goes $16 million, and now we're going to put $32 million on top of that, and then we're going to raise taxes 3% a year for a year, for a year, for a year, for a half a decade, at least, if not a full decade. Okay, thank you. Now, in the 
Lowry. The question is, um, is there something that has been discussed here that you would like to follow up? Um, absolutely. I think um, we spent a lot of time talking about the budget situation and talking about things that we would ideally like to see in our schools, um, improvements we'd like to make. Um, I think we need to remember that there is a big difference between what we would like to ideally have in our community and what we must absolutely do and what we can afford. And I really feel like the focus of the school board needs to come back to academics and having our students prepared for the workforce, prepared to go on to higher education if that's what they choose, prepared to be contributing citizens of um, the Commonwealth and you know the world. And academics need to be in the forefront of those decisions, and we need to make those decisions within the means that we have available. Okay. And uh, finally, John Ussolini. If there we go. There you go. The question is: Is there something that has been discussed here on which you would like to follow up? <coughs> What's lost in this is it's the idea that facilities do matter. We have a district that has six aging facilities. In a study that was done by McKissick and Associates, $6.9 million of mechanical, electrical, and plumbing upgrades need to be done across six buildings. We didn't have enough money to do upgrades to the entrances of Eisenhower and to e or Eisenhower and uh, East Pike. It would cost another $1.3 million. So you're looking at almost $9 million, $8 million of upgrades that are needed to keep our fiscal plant going and security going. And it doesn't address the issues that, have, that were raised by our custodians in my re buildings and grounds report. It doesn't address anything moving forward educationally. And what, what you have then is if we don't address these issues, we're going to be continually st uh, stuck with older buildings. The new plan with the, two, with the new Ben Franklin and the revised East Pike will take three of our older buildings out and we can, can, can work on repairing the high school Thank of the junior high. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, it is time for our closing statements. Our uh, event this morning brought to you by Spaghetti Vendors in downtown Indiana, proud to serve the public interests of Indiana County by serving as the presenting sponsor of this morning's Indiana School Board debate, Spaghetti Vendors Absolutely Italian. Now, we've made our random drawing, and each of the candidates know the order in which we will have our closing statements this morning. Each of you will have 90 seconds. And we will begin with Udo Lowry. Um, first off, I want to thank um, Brenda Broadcasting for providing us with this opportunity. Um, I think this is the first time all seven of us have been um, in the same room at the same time talking about these issues, so um, thank you for that opportunity. As we talked about, finances are really going to be the driving issue that the school board is going to face. And we are going to need to prioritize what the expenditures are, the school board is going to have to engage the community and continue to work towards a balanced budget. In addition, rebuilding relationships with the community and taxpayers who don't feel like they have been heard, listened to, or respected is another important issue that is critical for the school board um, to work on. That being said, educating our students should really be the primary issue that the school district is going to need to address. And we will need to make decisions, both fiscal, physical plant, technology-wise, make those decisions to positively impact the education that we offer. Um, I'm a taxpayer. I'm a parent. I am willing and committed to serving on the school board and doing the best that I can to improve the education that we can offer to our students. My problem-solving skills, my commitment to listening to people, my willingness to work with others are going to hopefully help me um, positively contribute to the school board. Please come out and vote on May 16th and Impact Change. Thank you very much. Barbara Barker will have the next chance uh, for her closing statement. Yes. Uh, you know, I've been to the board meetings committee meetings since September. I have demonstrated I have the time to do this job. It is a large time commitment. Uh, I've also been out in the community and parents are saying there's not enough teachers. We are too thin on the teachers. 
and the taxpayers are saying, we can't afford the taxes right now. We have a responsibility to our community, and I want to listen to the community to make our schools the best. And it seems obvious that Mr. Ussolini and Mr. Giese differ in opinions than I do. And they might say, we're saying misinformation. My suggestion towards that is that Monday night at 7.30 is a board meeting. Right before the board meeting at 6 p.m. is a building and grounds committee meeting. At last, um, uh, last mentioned that the architects will be there giving a presentation. Directly after presentation, it will go to board meeting and the board will vote on the building plans. Cancel your sports, cancel whatever you have. Get to the meeting, get to the committee meeting at 6 o'clock, the board meeting at 7.30 if you have to be a little late, and see what's going on. See who's telling the truth. Uh, that's uh, Monday at East Pike Elementary School. Thank you very much. Okay. Shepard Gacy, your closing statement, please. In closing, on election day, on this pivotal election day, I would like voters to vote for the most qualified candidate based on their qualifications and experience to serve. I think that is probably the most critical of all the decisions voters are faced with. Who has the qualifications, experience, and skill set to move this district forward for the next four years? There are far more than one issue related to this candidacy, far more than one. The focus for almost six months now has been solely on building or not to build a new elementary. There are many considerations that are going to face the school board moving forward, and I think the board members need to be ready and prepared to answer the call to deal with those issues. Okay. Yes, sorry. So what I would suggest is really attempt to do your homework. I did some analysis of Mr. Harley's presentation from the board meeting on Monday. He's assuming a flat line tax revenue base of 0% increase throughout the uh, time, and that's not plausible. We, as stated today, know that the fixed costs are going up approximately 1.7% per year, which does affect revenue. Okay, very good, thank you. Mr. Ussolini, you are next. What offends, offends me today is not our dis disagreement over our views about this project. It's the fact that being an educator now is being labeled as something bad, that having an educator on the board is somehow detrimental to the future of this district. I'm very proud of the time that I've served in this district. I'm very proud of the contributions that I've made to this district. And I think my contribution as a board member has been absolutely essential in helping this board move forward and making the tough decisions that we've had to make. And that's no, let's make no mistake about it, we will continue to have to make tough decisions over the next 10, 20 years. Education is changing, funding is changing. It is a difficult, difficult business. Rest assured that I have attended almost every meeting this district has had, committee meetings, uh, outside meetings that I've been assigned to. I've tried to make sure that I've been completely informed as to what's going on in our district. I've been very proud to serve this district in many capacities, and I continue to ask that the, the voters consider all my contributions and, and vote me back on the board uh, to serve the next four years. Thank you. Okay, we are in the midst of our closing statements. 90 seconds for each of our candidates. And Thomas Harley, you are next. The illustration that Mr. Giese referred to is the numbers were taken from the from the um, uh, budget that was provided by the building uh, by the uh, by uh, Jared, uh, the business manager. Um, I didn't change anything on that illustration, but reduced, but took the tax, the tax increases out. That illustration showed, without a, without a doubt, that the that the budget was upside down without the tax increases, and that and that uh, we would be having no reserve within three years. Um, I used numbers that was provided to me. 
Um, I, I stand by that illustration. We are at a pivotal point. Um, this board that is currently sitting is tying the hands of future boards. And it does revolve around money. Um, we will not be able to afford the extra reading teacher or the extra math teacher. We will be deciding what programs to cut. Even if this building program goes, does not go through, we have, a, we have a hard road to hoe here in providing these students the education that our students deserve. And quite frankly, public education is the only hope for most of these children. Half of our children are free and reduced lunch. Half of our families are living below $32,000 a year. We have to respect that, and we have to find a way to educate these kids. Thank you very much. Kenneth Alt, your final statement this morning. Thank you. I think uh, Tuesday is a critical day. We have four citizens from the district that are against this project. And we have a current school board member and some uh, Jeff over there seeking election to the board who are for this project. And what Tom said about the budget is correct because we all looked at it. And I agree with what Barb, you, Tom, and Julia have said. And we've stood here and told the, pr uh, the truth. The truth may seem, you know, dark, but it isn't. There is light at the end of the tunnel. In eight to ten years, we will be able to have the money. Now, it's a critical decision. Indiana has a third of that population on fixed income. I don't see two, three hundred people building houses in Indiana School District. I think uh, the last time I looked at building permits in January, it was 34 for the borough, uh, White Township, and Armstrong Township. I don't see uh, the jobs coming. So I've just uh, run out of time. Vote, vote, vote. Thank you very much. And finally this morning, our closing statement from Julie and Termarkey Cooper. Okay, so I'm swimming in. Yeah. So I got I to gotta, I gotta get quick here. Um, I am optimistic, actually. I believe in this county. I believe in this district. I've lived here all my life. It's a beautiful place. Uh, but I'm optimistic in terms of we've got to be disciplined, and we can do it. Every dollar, money is not growing on trees right now in the Indiana Area School District, and every dollar has to count. No one in here, I think, is saying we shouldn't address facility issues. We need to do that. I'm certainly for addressing facility issues within a disciplined budgetary framework. I would prefer to see us switch managerially, perhaps, to a targeted number of costs per student. We're high on that number. So that's, th those, are, th those are some of my financial aspirations. We have to continue with technology. We have to continue with early childhood education and get every student reading well by the fourth grade. So these are not, this is not an easy situation. But if we all get together, we ought to be able to figure out how to get somewhere on this school, somewhere between a sort of a Taj Mahal facility and a bare bones facility uh, that, that, that Mr. Shrove is talking about. So we have to get somewhere in the middle here. This is what this election is about. Get out and vote about what you think. Because otherwise, we're just guessing. This election's going to tell us a lot, and it's up to, it's the fiduciary board that's going to have to take this election seriously. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all for visiting with us this morning. Our candidates debate. Uh, <laughs> we're happy that you're able to join us here this morning, and we'd like to uh, tell you that uh, we had over 1,000 people watching live on Facebook this morning, hundreds on the audio stream at 1160wcs.com. I can assume uh, we hope that the radio audience was even much larger than that, so I think there's been a lot of value uh, in your visit here this morning. Thanks going this morning to Spaghetti Vendors, our primary sponsors in downtown Indiana, serving the public interests of Indiana County by serving as the presenting sponsor of this morning's Indiana Area School Board debate, Spaghetti Vendors, absolutely Italian. And a word of thanks as well to the Cavalci Conference for helping us with the facilities here this morning as well. The Brian Kilby Show up next, and uh, we'll head toward the news at noon. Again, thank you all for being with us. It is 1160 WCCS and 101.1 FM. Thank you.